Okay, welcome everyone. This is the fifth and final of our Serving on Groups webinar series that are part of the Start Parent Leadership Development Training Project. For this project, we've partnered with the New Jersey Department of Children and Families Division of Family and Community Partnerships, Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant. We'd just like to take a minute to thank them for their support and funding. I'd also like to thank all of the START team who have worked to put this meeting together. Our presenters today are myself, Debbie Esposito, and Karen Antone. Behind the scenes on technical support and answering questions are Michelle Tyler and Tatiana DeGrosa. Next slide, please. So for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, this is the fifth in our webinar series, which covers the curriculum from servingongroups.org. This is the last in the series, but don't worry. If you are unable to join us for the previous webinars, you will have the opportunity to access recordings and handouts as well as any additional resources from the START project page on the SPAN website. We've provided these resources for you to use as a training tool. You can use them either alone or you can view the recordings and or the PowerPoint with your parent groups. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Next slide, please. So, a little bit about servingongroups.org. Serving on Groups That Make Decisions, a guide for families, we refer to it simply as the guidebook, is a tool to help build leadership skills in families and other individuals who are interested in, in or are currently serving on a decision-making group. It was developed in Wisconsin by the Wisconsin Family Assistance Center for Education, Training, and Support, Wisconsin FACETS. And and a growing need expressed by families who were serving on decision-making groups. These families who were serving on groups felt like they were unprepared to serve in this type of leadership role and therefore did not participate as actively as they would have liked. A group of stakeholders or community partners was convened to take a closer look at this issue. What they determined was that there are a number of key competencies that everyone needs at least a basic understanding of if they are to participate effectively in shared decision-making groups. Serving on Groups was first published in 2011, and in 2015 a second edition was pr printed with an enhanced data section. Now you know a little bit more about the origins of our curriculum, let's move on to today's program. Our goal for today's webinar is for you to understand the important role of families on decision-making groups and to gain some skills that will make you more effect efficient and better able to, to participate on a decision-making group. But before we get started, Tatiana will help us find out who's here with us. Tatiana? Thank you, Debbie. Please respond to the poll that you see on your screen. I'm attending this webinar as a, please select one, parent member of my county council, parent or caregiver, not a CCYC member, CCYC coordinator slash staff member, or community partner. Most of you have voted. I will give you a few more seconds before I close the poll. Okay, ready to close. With us today, 25% of the attendees are parent and or caregivers, not CCYC members. Around one-third of you are CCYC coordinators or staff members, and the majority are community partners. Welcome to today's presentation. We have another poll for you to respond. Please take a few minutes to read the questions and respond to the poll on your screen. I'm viewing this webinar along with how many other people? Please select one. You are viewing it alone with one additional person, two more people, three, four or more piece, people. Okay, closing the poll right now. Okay. Here we go. Uh, the majority of you are attending or viewing this webinar alone today. Um, about one-fifth are joining us with one more person, and a small fraction of you are viewing this webinar with three or four or more people. Thank you so much. We are ready to begin our, our main presentation. 
Karen? We're going to start with the role of families on groups. In this section, we will review the role of families on decision-making groups. Our emphasis will be on the family representative role and ways to make sure all voices are heard and represented. Next slide, please. There are many types of groups. There are PTOs and PTAs, ad hoc committees where groups are formed for input on one topic or issues, support groups, and groups like the Board of Education where budget and policy decisions are made along with many others. One example of a decision-making group would be a special education parent advisory group where members share input about district programs for children with special needs and then decide what information to share with the district, the priority issues to propose to the district for improvement or change. So each group is unique in their mission, style, priorities, structure, and decision-making process. Your time is valuable, so choose your opportunity wisely. You'll want to find an opportunity that is meaningful to you. To make sure your time is productive, consider a few points before agreeing to serve. Review the group's mission statement, purpose, and history to see if the group is working on issues that are important to you. Find out the reason that the group was created in the first place. Is the group formal or informal? Is there a president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer? If there is no designated leader, Find out who organizes the meetings. Are you required to serve on additional committees? Ask if meeting notes from the past event meetings are available. This will help you understand what the group's been doing most recently. These meeting minutes record what the group has talked about, and they also identify any decisions that were made. And visit one of the group's meetings before you commit to joining. This will help you to see the group dynamics. Next slide, please. It's important to understand the big picture of how the group's work fits into the longer, larger organization. For example, special education, special education parent advisory groups are mandated for every district in New Jersey to share input from the parents with the school district. Like a PTA or a PTO, they are groups that work collaboratively with and within the school district. We also need to understand the process and timeline for considering and implementing the recommendations given by the group. It's important to ask the questions, who is responsible and when will this be done by? What has the group accomplished? Do they keep a list of success stories and changes that were made as a result of input from the group? And be patient and don't give up. Sometimes new groups need to build momentum. Things don't often happen right away. On the next slide, there's a resource to help define your group. Okay, now we're looking at a resource that you have in your handouts and will also be posted on our website. As you can see, this resource helps to organize information about the group. As someone new to a group, it can be used to build an understanding about your purpose on the group, the structure of the group, and the processes that the group uses. There are spaces to clearly define the type of group, activities the group is involved in, and the membership and roles of the group members. If you're already involved in or running a group, it could be used as an assessment tool to determine missing information about the group. You can also adapt this tool to use it as a resource for mentors and an orientation for new members. Now we're going to take a poll. Tatiana? Yes, thank you, Karen. Um, as Karen just mentioned, um, she mentioned a few um, pieces of information essential to know before you join the group. Uh, in your opinion, with the next poll, in your opinion, what is the most effective way to get information about the group before you join? Please select one that applies. Read past minutes. Visit a meeting prior to your first meeting as a member. Talk to someone who has been a member of the group. 
go to the website if the group has one, or all of the above. Please respond to the question on your screen. Okay, most of you have voted. I'll just give you a few more seconds before I close the poll. All right, three, two, one. Oh, thank you. Um, some of you mentioned that it is essential to talk to someone who has been a member of the group. Um, check out their website if there is one. Um, most of you um, agree that all of these uh, strategies are great ways to get information about the decision-making group before becoming a member. Thank you, those who responded. Back to Debbie. Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, so we've been talking a little bit about what you need to know about a group before you join. Let's go ahead and assume that you found the perfect group to join. This group meets all of your expectations, the mission and the vision statement are right in line with your own personal goals, and you've decided to join the group. So what now? You've learned as much as you can about the group as someone looking in from the outside, but now that you've joined the group, how do you get up to speed so that you can be an active and effective member? As a family representative, you'll be required to bring the family perspective to the decision-making process. Community members rely on family representatives to bring their interests and concerns to the discussion. There are a few things to do as you begin your new role. Connect with the parent who served before you to get an honest picture of your role. Ask for a mentor in the group who can serve as your guide as you, as you begin. That may indeed be the parent that was in your role before you. Always try to come to the meeting prepared. If the group is going to be discussing or reviewing a draft document at the meeting, it might be helpful for you to read a, a copy of that ahead of time. Find out if the group has bylaws or procedures that guide the way they operate. If so, ask for a copy of the most recent version and review them. Ask what the process is for requesting reimbursement or a stipend, especially if childcare is needed or in order, in order for you to participate, or if you have out-of-pocket expenses, or if travel is required. Many groups provide um, a stipend or a gas card to cover your expenses. Finally, think about how you want to introduce yourself to the group. Make sure you plan your introduction carefully. You may only have a few minutes or, le or less to introduce yourself, so you want to make sure that you state a little bit about yourself, why you're there, and why you will be, what you will be bringing to the group. On the next slide is a resource we think will be helpful in doing just that. So sharing your family story. Being able to tell your story and that of your family in a succinct and concise way is very important when building relationships. When you tell your story, you want to answer three questions. Who are you? What brings you to the group? You might talk a little bit about your history here so that people will understand what motivates you. What do you bring to the group? Are you a visionary, a planner, a nurturer? What's your leadership style? This becomes very important when determining what role you may want to fill in the group. Fill on the group, I'm sorry. Um, Sharing your story also is so important in, in connecting with members on your group. There are people there who will definitely identify with different parts of your, of your story, and that makes you more relatable and more approachable as a member of the group. This tool provides a template to help you reflect on your story and to be able to share it in a way that will allow you to make the most impact in the least amount of time. Next slide, please. Okay, when families join decision-making groups, one of their most important jobs is to represent the voice of families in their community. Family representatives on groups serve as liaisons to families by giving them information they need to know. This information will help families participate and contribute in meaningful ways. For example, uh, many school districts have community advisory committees. These committees function to allow members of the community to, li to liaise with school boards um, or other government or other decision-making uh, bodies. So 
parents are able to give their input to the school board. School board knows what's going on in the community, and and, a con and in in response, the community is able to hear what is being discussed at the school board meetings. So the family representatives on these community advisory committees um, are key in communication between school board or you know school board or other decision making groups and families that they serve. Families representatives also help pass along input and questions from families to people who need this information. As a family representative, it's your job to represent the voice of many families, not just your own. But remember, families aren't able to give you input if they can't find you. It's a good idea to be accessible to families by attending parent group meetings and other community or school meeting events. In my district, for example, I often see school board members as well as our community advisory committee members at concerts, school, you know, band concerts, band, you know, school concerts, choirs, board meetings, football games. In these places, they're easily available to talk to in a setting that's not so formal and perhaps intimidating. Of course, the information sharing goes both ways. Be sure as a, as a member of a group a family representative to provide feedback to families so that they can see the impact that they've made with their suggestions or their input. Provide summary reports about the group's decisions and share them in places where families will see them. For example, on the school website or Facebook or you know other social media that you know your families are participating in. If you're feeling like there are families that you haven't been that haven't been receiving any put from, that you haven't been receiving any input from and want to represent better, you might need to reach out to them by creating a brief survey, plan a focus group, but remember to always be mindful of confidentiality. These days especially, it's always important to be careful when dealing with people's personal information. On this next slide is an activity called the Family Leadership Checklist. This activity is included as one of the handouts in our webinar. The purpose of this activity is to better understand the role and responsibilities that you might be considering with a group. Before you take on a family leadership role, it's so important to understand the scope and role that you're taking on and the extent of its commitment. Um, now, Tatiana is going to... Uh, yes, do are you ready for the next poll? Thank you, Debbie. We are. Sure. Okay, uh, launch a poll. In addition to the um, examples that Debbie shared with our audience today, um, we would like to know, as a representative to other families, which of these um, do you consider to be your responsibility? Please um, check all that apply. Again, I'll read the question. As a representative to other families, which of these are your responsibility? Make sure all opinions of families are on the table. Share outcomes of group meetings with other families. Talk to other families about issues the group addresses. Okay, please respond to the poll question on your screen. Majority of you have voted. I'll just give a few more seconds before I close the poll. The numbers are climbing. That's good. Okay. Three more seconds. Three, two, one. Closing the poll. Okay. Here we go. Um, what can I say? The majority of you um, agree that making sure that opinions or perspectives of um, families are um, openly discussed at their decision-making table. Um, you also agree that um, sharing outcomes of group meetings with those who were unable to attend um, is an excellent idea, as well as um, talking to other families about issues that the group addresses and maybe um, inviting them to attend. Um, thank you, those who responded, and uh, we are going back to Karen this time. Okay, we're, oops, sorry. We're now going to discuss skills for serving on groups. Remember that the most effective teamwork starts with well-prepared members. Necessary skills for serving on groups are preparing, participating, follow-up, and facilitating a meeting. 
We'll take a look at each one of these areas in more detail and provide tips and strategies to help you be the best group member that you can be. Next slide, please. Okay, preparing for a meeting. To prepare for a meeting, some tips are keep a calendar. You might want to use an online calendar like Google so you can share your calendar with other team members. Keep meeting dates and times recorded. Make your calendar accessible so people will know meeting dates in advance. Read the agenda and additional items sent for the meeting. Always try to get the agenda ahead of time so you can prepare for the meeting. You can also contact the group leader if you'd like to add a topic to the agenda. And even if there is no written agenda, you can ask the leader to list the meeting topics. Review past meeting minutes. Read the minutes through for accuracy and to make sure they recorded all of the important information. It's important to add time frames and don't forget to add the person responsible to ensure that there is someone accountable and to be able to contact them for follow-up. Organize your thoughts. Think about and write down your comments ahead of time so you'll be prepared to discuss the agenda items and additional materials. Remember, you are an equal member of the group and it is important for you to offer not only your thoughts but also the ideas and perspectives of everyone you represent. Keep learning by researching items listed in the agenda and in the additional materials sent before the meeting. There may be data and other documents that can support the interests of your group. Build an in-depth understanding of issues, know the budgeting process, have an idea of policies and other influences that may be of interest to your group. A few good ways to find more information are to visit your local library to ask for assistance to, and to access online resources. If you're working with a school district, you can find information on their website, practice good listening skills and communication skills, and talk to other people. Parents are often a great resource. Ask where they find information about topics and issues that you care about. Okay, next slide, people, uh, please. Okay, thank you, Karen. So um, now, in addition to excellent tips Karen just shared with us, um, we would like to know uh, what other ways can you prepare um, to serve on a group? Uh, we would like you as audience um, type in your questions in the chat box, and we will read it out loud to share with everybody. So what other ways can you prepare to serve in a group? Any personal suggestions that come to mind? We will allow several um, few minutes to um, for typing. I know there are um, groups of people, and maybe uh, they would like to share their thoughts. OK. All right, uh, here are some of the answers that's that coming in. Um, okay, Jennifer um, said that being open-minded and listening to others is a great way to serve on a group or participate on a group. Okay, Miriam is suggesting that um, inviting others to the meetings if possible. Mm, Cassandra um, mentioned that researching the needs of the community is an excellent way. Okay, um, um, Jennifer um, also um, shared that being flexible with time, being time conscious is very important uh, when serving on a decision-making group. Okay, we'll allow a few more minutes. Keep sharing those are excellent suggestions. And I do just want to remind everyone that if you do want to raise your hand, we can unmute you so that you can share that way also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A parent who is watching the webinar or participating on the webinar with Cassandra um, 
uh, Keith May County for Young Children um, um, suggested consistency uh, from meeting to meeting, meeting structure consistency and attendance are very important. Um, Kim uh, bring, uh, suggests that bringing experts um, in area that are interested to the group, yes, having um, speakers, um, experts in the field to um, address some of the questions that group might have, yes. Um, Cassandra, again, um, 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 stated that clear goals, mission, and vision are important for a group functioning. Some of the other ones I, um, I skimmed through, I saw that um, um, RSVP uh, to the group um, meetings you are attending, if, if it's required, it's also um, it's a polite, well, you know, it's good manners. Um, if it's requested to RSVP for meeting attendance, please do so. Um, it is also a great um, way to meet people by introducing yourself to other members. Um, Brenda shared that reading the meeting agenda beforehand is always um, a good idea. And arriving early, 10, 15 minutes before the start of the meeting actually um, helps um, you to take care of other things like using the restroom and uh, picking up um, handouts and materials. Okay, uh, Jessica. Oh, Jessica offered an alternative. Um, Offer dial-in for those who can't attend in person. That's so true, Jessica. Thank you. That's a great idea. I like that idea. I've used that actually several times in my own meetings, and I find it to be really effective for people who can't, who maybe have small children at home or otherwise can't get out to a meeting to be able mm -hmm. to dial in. That's great. And the last one, have enough copies of material, so handouts for everyone at the meeting. Yes, thank you very much for those of you who participated. Those are uh, helpful suggestions, all helpful suggestions. Okay, we are going back to Karen. Okay, yes, thank you for all of those great suggestions. Now we're going to talk about participating in a meeting. To participate in a group, attend all meetings. It's important to find out if all meetings are in person or there may be alternative methods for participation such as conference calls or online meetings. Attending meetings helps to build relationships and your own understanding of what the group is about and also what the group's trying to do. It will also show that you are committed to that group. If you're unable to attend, Remember to let the leader know ahead of time. Make sure to get the notes or meeting minutes as soon as possible so you can review them. Take notes to reference key points, timeframes, and assignments. Learn the lingo, like specific words and abbreviations used by members. If you're at a meeting where people are throwing around acronyms or unfamiliar words or phrases, create a cheat sheet or list to help you have a better understanding of the discussion. Also, try a new role in the group, like leading the discussion, recording the meeting minutes, or being timekeeper. Some groups even incorporate a rotating facilitator role, so everyone is given the opportunity to facilitate a meeting. This helps the group dynamics so one person is not dominating the leadership of the group. Be a mentor. To new members of the group, once you've been serving on the group for a while and you feel comfortable, sharing your experiences and success stories with new members will make them feel welcome. And listen for understanding. When you do not understand what is being said, ask, what I think I hear you saying is, which is also known as restating what you've heard. Then ask, is that right? This gives the speaker a chance to clarify and add more information if needed. It will also ensure that you have a good understanding of what was said. Next slide, please. Following up after a meeting. There are usually materials to read and activities between meetings. Some groups have subgroups that meet to carry out a specific task for the group. There may be an, an educational subgroup 
or a fundraising or recreational subgroup, for example. Organizational skills are important to help you meet the responsibilities of your role. A great habit to get into is to follow up after a meeting. You can do this by referring to your notes. During the meeting, make a list of follow-up items and questions to ask. This will help you keep track of important information to refer to after the meeting. Staying organized. Use a binder to store all material so it's easier to locate information during the meetings. Make a separate label divider for contacts, bylaws, ground rules, agendas, meeting notes, reports, projects, and reference materials. Use technology. Electronic files that are sent to you ahead of time can be stored in a folder on your computer desktop for easy access. If you have a laptop, you can type the meeting notes into a document during the meeting or use a document that people can share and add to during and after the meeting. You could review the written guidance, like the group's bylaws, ground rules, and procedures. Reflect on what you've learned and what was discussed during the meeting. Connect with a mentor to become more comfortable with the group work and to help understand the hip history and the purpose of the group. Review the data. Take the time to study the information and understand what the group is trying to do. And keep learning. You want to research the topics in other areas, states, and organizations. Great ideas might come from looking at the work of others. Next slide, please. Conflict is a natural part of group dynamics, but it can be complex. Try to understand individual differences while helping people avoid becoming too entrenched in a fixed position. So keep an open mind. You might learn something or increase your understanding of another's point of view. Use I statements, not you statements. Instead of saying, you're not listening to me or you don't understand, you can say something like, I feel unheard or I feel like I'm not being understood. Don't take things personally. You want to keep a focus on the issue and possible solutions. Ask questions. Find out the facts by asking who, what, when, and why. Asking questions opens communication so much better than making statements. Stay focused on the topic. Refer to the agenda as a reminder. A good idea is to keep a parking lot where you can list topics that come up that stray from the agenda so they can be discussed after you finish the agenda items. Focus on solutions. If you provide an issue or concern, offer a solution or potential options. It's always better to have some ideas for problem solving so it doesn't appear that you're just complaining or asking others to fix everything and take a break. If you feel overwhelmed, just excuse yourself for a few minutes. If the discussion gets heated, ask everyone to stand up and move around, and then you can come back to the table refreshed. And remember the group's purpose. It should be the center of the conversation. Okay, next slide. So to resolve conflict, follow these rules. Pay attention to the interests that are being presented. By listening carefully, you'll most likely understand why the person is adopting his or her position. Listen first and then talk second. To solve a problem effectively, you have to understand where the other person is coming from before defending your own position. Make sure that good relationships are the first priority. As far as possible, make sure you treat the other calmly and that you try to build mutual respect. Do your best to be courteous to one another and remain constructive, even under pressure. Keep people and problems separate. Recognize that in many cases, the other person is not just being difficult. Real and valid differences can lie, lie behind conflictive positions. 
by separating the problem from the person, real issues can be debated without damaging your working relationships. Set out the facts. Agree and establish the objective, observable elements that will have an impact on the decision. Use data and other materials to support your position. And explore options together. Be open to the idea that a third position may exist, and you can get to this idea by working together. Managed in the wrong way, real and legitimate differences between people can quickly spiral out of control, resulting in situations where cooperation is breaking down and the group's mission can be threatened. To calm these situations down, it, take, it helps to take a positive approach to conflict resolution, where discussion is courteous and non-confrontational, and the focus is on issues rather than on individuals. If this is done, as long as people listen carefully and explore the facts, issues, and possible solutions properly, conflict can often be resolved effectively. Next slide. Okay, an effective meeting starts with a good facilitator. To facilitate a meeting, there are some common strategies that good facilitators use. First of all, they try to make everyone feel comfortable and valued. They allow time for small talk, thank people for their participation, and use open body language, like uncrossed arms. They encourage participation by all members by using open-ended questions, dividing into small groups, and using flip charts and handouts. Visual props help to keep people focused and engaged. Remember, there are extremes of participation in groups that sometimes the facilitator needs to balance. Some people may be quiet, while others may dominate the conversation. We want to make sure that everyone's ideas and their perspectives are heard. A good facilitator prevents or manages conflict by using team building activities, setting ground rules, and drawing attention to things that everyone agrees on instead of focusing on the disagreements. Starting meetings by going over ground rules can set the tone for a meeting and have everyone understand the expectations for behavior. They also actively listen and observe the others in the group by scanning reactions to comments or issues. You can usually take a reading of the group to tell if there needs to be more discussion or maybe there isn't enough information to make a decision. A facilitator also clarifies group discussions by summarizing and rephrasing what was said. They may use the phrase, I hear what you are saying is. They also support quality decisions being made by reminding the group of the decision deadlines, reviewing the criteria and supporting information, and polling the group before major decisions to avoid surprises. They also ensure outcome-based meetings by staying on track and making sure the group is getting done what needs to be done by keeping the group members focused, recording decisions, and developing an action plan. When people see the group has value, they will feel like their participation is time well spent. And finally, they recognize and express appreciation for member contribution to the work of the group and participation during meetings and activities. We need to take the time to appreciate people taking time out of their busy lives to participate in the group. Thank you, Karen, um, for sharing that facility, facilitating meetings and dealing with con uh, conflict, um, supporting quality decisions are excellent ways to um, uh, make your group as productive and decisions um, uh, uh, effective. Uh, right now, we would like to take a pause because we uh, know that the experts, we have experts in the room, and you are the experts in what you do. We would like to learn from you some of the strategies that work um, within your groups when facilitating meetings or conducting meetings. Please, um, again, use the chat box to respond. Um, 
to the question, what works for you? Uh, or maybe sharing some of the skills and tips that are important uh, in your work. As a coordinator, as a leader. Okay, and we'll read your responses uh, in a few moments. Give you time to type in. Okay. Um, a Barbara's suggestion here is uh, respecting and valuing all opinions. Excellent. Yes. Could not agree. Have agreed more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jennifer um, proposes keeping our agenda on our vision and mission statements. Okay. Oh, maybe using the. Um, a giant post-it notes or post your agenda as well as wish, vision and mission statements for everyone to see just not to lose focus. Excellent, yes. Uh, create ground rules and follow them. Yes, Miriam, indeed. Excellent idea. Rita, agreeing on key points. Oh, that's a good one. Maybe stopping after um, certain a discussion or a certain period of time and summarizing key points and making sure that we reach the agreement so there is no misunderstanding later on. Good point. Um, Kim say, suggests that setting ground rules right from the beginning is critical for everyone to understand the vision. Mm -hmm. um, Ground rules. Um, we some I think we covered this um, earlier in the series. Um, excellent way to um, develop in the, in the start of the process. Uh, we're sometimes called participation agreement. Um, most commonly known as ground rules. Okay. Um, Again, Dawn, a parent, um, suggests that uh, developing SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, um, um, relevant, and um, um, time, um, time focused. Mm -hmm. In addition to this, uh, other suggestions included um, a breakup into small groups uh, for discussions, for more in-depth discussions. Um, uh, what else? I'm um, seeing uh, using round robin technique to share ideas one person at a time. Yes, excellent way to um, prevent um, one person dominating the conversation and allowing everybody to contribute. Um, I have a couple. Um, Tatiana Deidre um, suggests that we use chart paper so everyone can have input and feel valued. Um, Using a parking lot, which Karen already, which Karen mentioned as well, which is a very good idea, and always do introductions um, mm -hmm. of everyone, and at times do icebreakers, so everyone has an opportunity to give their input and keep a track of time. Okay, keep sending in your excellent um, uh, advice. Um, I have one here. Um, ha uh, allow a meet and greet. So people get to know each other personally. Yes, allow time for icebreakers or um, greetings in the start at the start of the meeting um, to get to know each other and build relationships. Okay. Mm. I'd like to add a little bit more about the parking lot. Sure. When um, oftentimes the group is uh, having the discussion and following the agenda, and someone has a story they need to tell or something that is really off track of the agenda and we want to make sure that they understand we really want to hear what you have to say so that's why we use the parking lot so that we're writing down their name we go through the agenda and tell them that's the first thing that we're going to do after the agenda is go down the list of the parking lot so that way people understand yes we do want to hear what you have to say but um, we're, we're going to get through the agenda first and then we'll, we'll discuss what you need to discuss so that everyone feels like they have a chance to, to put their input in. Mm -hmm. oh, Kim shared one more she said be consistent in showing the goals in order to show accomplishments which can provide ongoing motivation for the group. 
Excellent. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your expertise. Um, are there any other questions for our presenters? Please type in your questions if you have any, and we'll be sure to address them before the end of the webinar. We would like um, now to move on. Debbie? Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, so I just want to review a few um, resources that we have both in that we have attached to the webinar and that, that you can access online. The first one is our listening awareness inventory activity. This is an activity that you can do with a group. Um, the purpose is to reinforce the listening, the importance of listening as one of the most important and key keys to communication and understanding of others. It asks questions like, do you let pe people finish what they're trying to say before you speak? And do you withhold judgment about the person's idea until he or she has finished? There's a, an entire inventory of questions like this to gauge your listening skills. This particular activity is even better if you give it to someone who knows you well and ask them to give you feedback on each of these questions in terms of how they observe your listening techniques. You could try it and remember to be uh, non-judgmental and not take it personally when they give you feedback. It might be a really interesting learning experience for both of you. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Millions of people use the community toolbox each year to get help taking action. It's, I personally have just uh, become aware of it, and I was very excited to go on the community toolbox. Um, it, you can use it to help, like I said, get take action to teach tr and train others in organizing for community development. You can dive into it to find help assessing community needs and resources, um, addressing social determinants of health, engaging stakeholders, anything you might want to do that has to do with um, meeting, facilitation, or community organizing, you can find on the community toolbox. It's an excellent, excellent resource. I really can't stress it enough. I would encourage you all to check it out if you have not already been aware of it. Um, planning and evaluation, sustaining your efforts. The Community Toolbox provides uh, resources and tools to help people work together to build healthier communities. Here's a quick overview. You can visit the learning, um, I don't know, Michelle, if you, you're already back, but if you could go back to that, um, the live version. Michelle? Sure, one second. Hitting escape is not going back. Okay. Yeah, I'll just do this. Okay, that's great. If you can go back and if you can find the learn a skill right there on the top left, um, on the on the board, yeah. So you can learn um, if you scroll down a little bit, toolkits or hit toolkits. As you can see, creating and maintaining partnerships, uh, assessing community needs and resources, analyzing problems of goals, problems and goals. I mean, this is a wealth of knowledge here. It is truly a toolkit. Um, if you go back and go up to the top, where it says, um, "Well, you already hit toolkits." Yeah, you can you can get a quick start on any kind of core competencies um, that you might need for your community work. Um, next slide, please. I'm sorry, when you go back, you can get to the next slide. Okay, so if you'd like to explore these resources, meaning the Serving On Groups resources, more fully, um, we also encourage you to visit the website Serving on groups that make decisions.org or serving on groups.org. Um, besides the guidebook and the trainer manual, there's also a website. That's the servingongroups.org where anyone can go to register for upcoming webinars, view an introductory video of the guidebook, take part in online modules, and download individual sections of the guidebook in English or in Spanish. So you have the you have the uh, what the guidebook right there online. You can download it in sections for free, or you can order it online um, and get the entire guidebook that way in English or in Spanish. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's the 
these are the links to the resources that we just mentioned, the uh, serving on groups. Uh, we've been talking about the START project, uh, upcoming, the START project page, where you can find out all our upcoming events, including our roundtables, our parent leadership special education roundtables. Um, also on the START page, you can access the CCYC parent leadership development training, uh, which, of which this is part, the serving on groups. Um, and SPAN, just the SPAN website in general has a wealth of parent training initiatives um, regarding um, uh, what anybody can jump in here. Uh, we have needs on special needs. Um, you can talk, we have we information have about bullying, um, literacy, uh, disproportionality. All of that can be found on the SPAN. How to find a parent group if you're looking for one. Exactly. Um, great information there. So, yeah, we encourage you to check these uh, websites. They all are going to be included. They're all included on the PowerPoint, which is one of the handouts, and which will also be uh, linked to that will also be sent to you as a follow-up. So you will definitely have access to all of this information. Um, were there any, I saw some other questions, Tatiana, I believe. Were there any other questions? Uh, yes, there is a question, Michelle. Um, Jennifer has asked, how do you work with others who share the same vision but do not have the same motivation to work on it? I'll take this one. Okay. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is that you uh, stress the impact that it will make and the outcomes for whether it's families or students. Um, get people excited about why you're doing this and how much it's going to create change. And then you can break it down into um, easy steps. You know, take a look at your goal and make it seem like it's not so overwhelming. Look, all we have to do is this and this and this, and hopefully we'll really create some positive change. Does anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I would actually. Um, I think that in addition to what you just said, this is a good um, a good place for sharing your story. A lot of times when you find people aren't aren't you you feel like they're not motivated, maybe this is where you might want to use some of that active listening. Not only are you share do would do you want to share your story, but you want to hear their story. Find out what it is that's motivating them. Why do they want to why you said that they you already said that they do share your vision. So you got to find out what motivates them, and, and maybe make the you know explain to them, or maybe you're able to you'll be able to understand what it is that motivates them, and how you can get them more willing to jump in and um, to serve the way that you to, with the same kind of enthusiasm that you have. You might also find out what their reluctance is. Exactly. So I mean, serve, I mean, sharing your story is just such a a, a key tool. And for so many, for so many aspects of this kind of work, you, when you understand what motivates people and what's behind, what their history is, um, you can understand why they have a lot of the opinions they have. You know, you get to understand a little bit more about what their strengths are. So sharing your story is key. And when you share your story, it makes people more willing to share their stories with you. So I would say that that's where that kind of thing comes into play, building relationships. Thank you both, uh, and Jennifer th thanks you as well. If there are no other uh, final questions, we would like to uh, move on to our final announcements before we complete today's webinar. Okay. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming here today. We appreciate you spending this last hour with us. Um, if you have any more questions or if you need any help using any of the tools that we've referenced here today, you can contact us at the www.spanadvocacy.org. Um, you can also contact our project director, Diane Malley, at the number given on the screen or, and use the email given on the screen. Um, Thank you again for sharing, for, for, for spending this time with us, and we hope that we would like all of you to have a, a great day. Um, if I can oh, just add, you will be getting an evaluation. If you, if you, will, you will be getting an evaluation at the end of the webinar, and like always, it really does help us with um, formulating future activities and things to do with the group. So please fill that out. Take a moment to do that. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.